Watching the uh, world news last week, you'd have been hard pushed to miss that there have been riots on the streets of Zimbabwe. It was hoped the end of Robert Mugabe's 40 year regime would usher in a better future. But has anything really changed? Has the chance of a new beginning already ended? You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. After decades of what you might well have termed a dictatorship, the majority of Zimbabweans turned out to vote in last week's elections. Even international observers were allowed in to oversee the voting process, but from the outside, looking in, it seemed perhaps as if nothing had really changed. <laughs> Politics in Zimbabwe is entering uncharted territory. For the first time in nearly 40 years, its former leader Robert Mugabe isn't at the helm. But as a new president steps in and accusations of vote rigging surface, are hopes of a new democratic era already fading. After Zimbabwe gained independence in 1980, Robert Mugabe settled into power, first as Prime Minister and then as President from 1987. His leadership was dominated by accusations of vote rigging and corruption and a downturn in a once prosperous economy. But late last year his time in office came to an end following a soft military coup that eventually forced him to resign. His exit sparked celebrations across the country. Fast forward to today and the country's ruling ZANU-PF party is still in power. Emerson Emengagwa appointed after Mugabe's resignation won last month's presidential election. I pledge to be the president of all Zimbabweans. A president of those that voted for me and those who did not. The Electoral Commission says he got 50.8% of the presidential vote. His party also won two-thirds of the seats in Parliament. Over 70% of Zimbabweans voted in the election. It's a high turnout for a country that's seen decades of dictatorship. Voting had been peaceful, but by the end of last week, riots had broken out on the streets of Harare amid speculation of a ZANU-PF landslide. Last year, Enemgagwa promised free and fair elections, but his main rival, Nelson Chamisa, has accused the ruling party of vote rigging. Mr Munangagwa knows that he has lost this election. If he had won this election, this election would have been announced long back. For the first time in 16 years, international observers have been allowed to overlook the voting process. The military who helped oust Mugabe were seen as heroes in November. Now their role in the Harare riots has labelled them once again as defenders of ZANU-PF. This election is an historic turning point for Zimbabwe, but realistically, has anything changed? Can a new look ZANU-PF turn the economy around? Or are we looking at the same regime under a new name? Well, very good to have you all along at the round table. We welcome Sibongili Sihwa, acting chairperson for the Movement for Democratic Change, the opposition, that is Zimbabwe's main opposition party. And George Shearer is with us, Zimbabwean political analyst. And we also have Chris Van Dome, research associate at Chatham House, focusing on the political economy of Southern Africa. Let me ask you both, as Zimbabweans, uh, George, you, you first of all, has anything really changed? Change is not the word I use. I say it's something is different. And I think in noticing what is different, you're then able to anticipate what that difference marks. But when so, something changes, it's different. So has anything No, no, not necessarily. Changed? Not necessarily. Changing, changing, you can change, you can change your political leaders. You can change uh, timetable. That's not the same as what's different. Is anything different? Yes, there is. It, for the first time in Zimbabwean politics and policy and culture, you have the media are able to be there. They might not be perfect, though, but they're there. Right? internationally. You're having people who being able to say what they want to say, which they were not able to say before. 
people were able to conduct themselves politically in all sorts of ways, in a way in which they were not able to do it before. Zimbabwe is talked about in a language that is different from what it was for the last 18 years. So you can see these differences, and those differences did not drop from manner. They were produced by particular material conditions in which the current leadership of ZANU okay. is very much, very much so, so, so let me ask Simon Lee here. Um, is um, Gagwa just a, a younger, although not young, younger version of Mugabe leading the same political establishment with perhaps an even more extreme record when it comes to enforcing security measures? Uh, talking from a Zimbabwean point of view and uh, an opposition uh, person, as far as I'm concerned, the system is still the same. Um, Nangagwa is just another Mugabe, but in a in a worse situation because he is the one who was involved with the Kukura Wundi. He was you have also to explain what that is. Uh, Kukura Wundi is where the people from Matabel and, and Miglans were massacred in the eighties and in the end By the uh, man they called the crocodile. Yes, by the name of the crocodile with the uh, parents Shiri who is now the Minister of Agriculture who was the leader who was the leader of the fifth brigade and uh, Chiwenga who was also up there. Uh, so, so what do you see the future for the country with Amangagwa in charge, the man they called the crocodile, um, if he is just um, a, a different version of Mugabe? What is the future for Zim? In November 2017, we were all looking for a change. As when he gave his statement, taking the oath of being the president, he said he will be the president of the people. and. All of us, we thought it would be a change. If you went to the Zim Embassy on that weekend, the people were in full swing, looking at the country changing. Why will it but not change? It won't change because the system which was used on this election is almost identical to what has been happening. The voters draw for starters, they said they introduced the BVR. That BVR, at the end of the day, the opposition members of uh, the country didn't get that uh, voters' draw. They got it uh, two days or three days before the elections. Okay, of that's the voting register. Yes, the voters' register, yeah. which they were supposed to have it well before and look at the discrepancies, which they well, ended... Well, they have until Friday, the opposition, Chris. So I'll come back to you, because I'd like to get some personal stories from both of you in just a moment. A um, long time since you were back there, I, I, I do know that. But, Chris, let me ask you, we're talking about the electoral process here before we get on to the economy. And I think it's Friday is the deadline for Chamisa and the MDC um, to have lodged their objections and for those objections to have been examined. What chance is there of the MDC or indeed the, any kind of opposition of getting this election overturned? <laughs> Well, they're gonna, there's going to be a statement today from the MDC, we've been told, um, which is likely going to be that, um, that challenge. Uh, this is something that throughout the electoral campaign, uh, Chamisa was building up towards, this sense of uh, if I win, it's a legitimate election. If I don't win, it's an illegitimate election. And that was a narrative that was spun throughout his campaign, building up to this moment of we haven't won, therefore we will challenge. And the key is going to be whether or not they're going to get that through the courts. Now, he has already come out and stated that you know, the courts are against him uh, in terms of the, um, the political dynamic with in the judicial system um, and you kind of have to look back to the 2013 elections as well and there are still cases from the disputes around that election still within the legal system so in terms of the chances of this thing getting so this is when Morgan Changra was in charge of the yeah. MDC correct yeah so, and that's still going through the court there are some cases still within the court system so in terms of a probability of whether or not this election is going to get overturned it's very unlikely for sure we're not going to hear by but, next Wednesday <laughs> we're not going to hear by next Wednesday, no. Um, I saw you nodding your head when George suggested that things have changed in Zimbabwe, but I'm wondering if they've just changed cosmetically. No, I think that there's a, a deeper change in terms of... Although you did say different rather than change. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. <laughs> there, is a, there is a change or a difference uh, in that... Uh, Mugabe's political legitimacy was built around his position as the liberation icon and he was revered throughout the region for that and you know if you travel throughout South Africa as well 
people still look at Mugabe as this person who generated that liberation for his people. Now, uh, Emerson Menengagwa doesn't have that quite so strongly, which is why since the uh, transition in November, he's been building up his political legitimacy around this idea of he will deliver economic change. And it's about economic renewal and economic reform because that's where he needs to build his political legitimacy. And apparently, according to these uh, results, that has scraped him through uh, the elections in generating this idea but, but, of but something's changed but something hasn't. T tell me if I've got this skew with here, but I mean, um, there, there is a difficult situation for him. He wants to change the economy, but at the same time, the country is being deindustrialized. Um, if the industrial base was built up again, that would be the support base for the people who oppose Amangagwa, <laughs> because that's the MDC's base, the youth industrialized. Can I come in there? Of course you can. <clears throat> the, 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 the thing about this is this. Go back to the, what I, I call the one part, the one center of power nonsense, which typified the period of Robin Gabe's leadership. There is, there, there is nothing, and that's one of the marked difference between Robin Mugabe and Mnangagwa. Yeah? What you're seeing is a recognition that power is in a number of places. If you get one key and you think you go to State House and you think you're going to find power there, you'll be surprised that it's not there. There's a recognition that has been an ongoing argument in ZANU. So what happens in November is a, is a shift to that perception that says power is in a number of places, one. The second is putting the political economy front stage and not the ideological. Okay, but okay. The, the, the economy and is a basket case. No. I think you've got to accept that. No, you've got no, to accept I don't. That I mean, Zanu I just want to finish Mug what I was going to say. Mugabe's base has been out in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's not in industrial centres. If the industrial base is built up as Amangagwa says he wants to do, that could take some support away from ZANU. The idea that the backbone of Zimbabwe's economy or its future has somehow framed in this notion of the industrial is misplaced. You have to go to how people live their lives in the day to day and try and figure out how the economic, the political, the, what the economic is for. That's what brought the land question into center stage. So this, this kind of juxtaposition of the industrial versus the rural or the land in economic languages is misplaced. George, and, I think, it, and I think just to, to echo what he was trying to describe, you, one cannot think about the future of Zimbabwe economically independent of the region. That's why the land question has appeared on the South African scene too, but because it's connected to those yeah. questions. I, 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 do, I do like hearing what you say, but I, mean, I want you to come in on this question of the youth and, and where the support um, for ZANU lies. Apparently the youth of today they are not like me when in 1980 Smith was gone and we had luxurious jobs. I will move from one job to the other. The youth we have now, some of them have got master's degrees, but they are selling eco cash and everything in the streets. They've never walked into a door of employment. It's always they have to walk here, sell that, sell this, sell that. So. For, for the president and the, the government of Zimbabwe to say we will change a situation, the agriculture was one of our best, one of our best things in Zimbabwe. But when they took the farms, yes, the land uh, issue was fine, but it's the way it was distributed. If they had distributed in the way, way, the ordinary person will get the farms, it would I, have been I, I, better. I think we're going back a long way and it would take more than just a half hour programme to, okay. to get into that. Um, but the question to you, you, Chris, is I mean, what reforms are needed and what reforms are possible? Well, the single biggest issue for him is going to be generating trust. It's a lack of trust yeah, okay. in government over the past decade or so that has ended up in this economic crisis or this con continual economic um, some say collapse, but I think that that's already happened. It's kind of bumping along the bottom. And in order to generate um, economic growth, there needs to be that trust in the policymakers. So this is seen most predominantly uh, in the cash crisis, where the government, with a shortage of US dollars, uh, has produced these bond notes, which, because people don't trust in that... Worthless. You, it has yeah, a... Uh, you have a tiered payment system, where if you've got US dollar cash, 
you'll pay less than if you pay in bond notes, which now you'll also pay less than if you pay from your e-swipe kind of RTGS account, mm -hmm. which is these electronic holdings of money, which are still non-transferable out of... You can't of use anywhere else. You can't use them anywhere else, which is why they don't have the value of the hard US dollar. But this is the thing. It's not just the trust in these bond notes, because the, there's been this rhetoric in the country and externally of the production of bond notes is going to result in the hyperinflation that we saw um, uh, back in 2008. But they, these uh, bond notes only make up of about 4% of the money supply. The real issue is that the government over the past decade has run considerable budget deficits, which it has financed by selling government debt into the banking system. So the core of the economic system is now built upon whether or not there's trust in the government. And that is going to be... Doesn't sound like very strong government. foundations. Well, what it does, though, I think what you need to, to, to own up to is that there is a recognition of that in Nangago. He doesn't say it's not happened. He says we have a crisis and it is this and we need to mend it and we, he offers a way to mend it. Whether we agree... Well, what is the way he's offering? Well, Very quickly because well, I want to get on to the he, personal. He says we need to gain the trust. Okay, which is his key word. And what is, and part of but the... But that's a word out there in the ether. No, that's no, not no, a it isn't. Thing, I, is it? It's I think, not like building no, no, a factory no, 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 it, I think it's key. Because, trust. I think it's key because if he, he says it, not me, he says it quite rightly, that economies thrive on trust. Perception is important. And if there is a level of distrust on the state's ability to turn around the economy, the first thing it needs to do is to gain that trust. Catch 22 there. Yeah. I, I mean, if, I, if, that's if, what you're not going to get that trust unless you're trustworthy. You're not going to appear trustworthy unless you can do something concrete. Mm -hmm. Can I get the why the can election was side? so critical, critical. for That's why the that election was critical. Okay. <laughs> can we get personal stories? And I want to come to you first, if, if I may, because you come from a part of Zimbabwe uh, where there was some terrible slayings. Yes. And a lot of the people, the current president, yes. Amun Gagwa. Tell us what happened to you and why you think he's responsible. And then we're going to get on to your personal story, George, about why in your part of Zimbabwe, he's regarded as a hero. So please, if you would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm from uh, Bulawayo, um, but born in... Second one, biggest city. Second biggest yeah. city, but born in the uh, capital city of my civilian south in Gwanda. Um, I was 18 uh, when we had the first Intumbani war. From Intumbani, there was a second Intumbani war, and then Kukurawendi. When we had the second in Tumbaniwo, I had my second child, and virtually we were being driven out of our houses. The army was knocking door to door. And was this when Emerson Amangagwa was yes. Minister of Defense? Yes. Yeah. Then after in Tumbaniwo, we had the Kukure Wendy. I was teaching in a remote area of Binga. Then immediately after that, I transferred into a school in Lupani. That's where I saw the atrocities. And from there, I left teaching for good, although oh, I want... blame him? He was the Minister of Defence then. And uh, as far as we are concerned, that's why we say he's the crocodile. He came and said, he came out in a plane with innocent colour into my table and to say, we are looking at the... We, we will... And uh, cleansing we, yes. would be a way of describing it. He didn't say it that way, yes. but we took it that way okay. as uh, the people in the area. Why a hero? You know, I think, let, let me just destroy a myth in one sentence, okay? There are, and it's important to do this. If you look at now what is now publicly available, the CIA report, that doesn't mean I like intelligence services. Look at the CIA redacted report of the 1982-83-4 of the same event and compare it to what has become common sense. They, they outline a completely different picture of what obtains in Zimbabwe between 1982 and 1985. Why is that important? We need to, we need to look at the facts as they exist, not as I'd like them to okay, be. Okay, that was more than one uh, sentence, uh, George, uh, but I've given you I'm about five. I'm coming to that. I want to ask you why he's a hero to you. Who, who is the, a hero? I mean, Gagwa, you said before... Ah, Mungagwa is, yeah, yeah, yeah. is a hero to me because of his involvement in the Crocodile Gang, the first unit of freedom fighters formed after 1963. And at that time, he is the one who takes up arms. He is the one who represents a moment of the break for my generation. That's one. Let me just add to nail one thing. 
Mnangagwa was the minister was the minister responsible for, for intelligence and security at the time of the Kukraun. Not defence. Yes, okay. no, not defence. And that that he was minister of defence. Wait a minute, it was not intelligence driven. If there was any intelligence at all, it's there in the CIA report. If there is an intelligence at all that that the that anyone drew from, it's carried from General Wall's stuff. So this idea that there was a coherent intelligence network then which is which is which drove this thing is not it is not the case it is not excusing his role but let's make him guilty for the things that he's responsible for the the door lies collectively on on the door of robert mugabe and robert mugabe through that one center of power refused dissent in government full stop so chris let's talk about the Zimbabwean image, if you like, um, the fact that it was, it was a frontline opponent of apartheid, it, it led an international movement in that direction, and yet it has gone completely fallen off the cliff in, in terms of its, its financial state. Why did it do that when its neighboring country, northern Rhodesia, Zambia, as it is now, seems to have weathered the storm better? What went wrong? Well, for sure there were some uh, bad policy decisions within Zimbabwe. Um, and it all started at the end of the 1990s, heavy debt after Zimbabwe's involvement in the Congo War. Uh, the day that's referred to Black Friday in Zimbabwe. Um, and that's when the sudden increase in uh, government spending comes from and printing money. Um, and then through these cycles of patronage, um, be it land, be it minerals. Um, so there's been this degradation over time. But importantly, from an outside perspective, um, that's why when the Zimbabwean economy almost halved in size, uh, there was this sense from the outside that this is a country that was kind of, um, you know, this was one of us, this was part of the gang, how could they do this? And so you had also this sense of, um, from a kind of external establishment, this, well, you've let us down. Um, when actually, if you go to Zimbabwe and you just take a complete snapshot, it's not you know, it's, it doesn't feel too dissimilar to many other countries in the region. They all face significant policy challenges. It was put on a pedestal. It was put on a pedestal. And so for that reason, that's why there's still this kind of real sense of, well, we can do something. And it's also because there's few um, serious or, uh, international um, interests there. It's why there's also been this kind of uh, values-based foreign policy towards it. You know, in, if you compare Sudan to Zimbabwe in the sanctions debate, uh, US are lifting sanctions on uh, Sudan, but uh, maintain them on Zimbabwe because it's a place where you can maintain a values-based foreign policy. And so, I think mm. what, what that does then, it, it re reproduces what I call the, the colony. It reproduces self perpetuate. It. it reproduces it. And I think what people don't realize that it is precisely that policy that strengthens ZANU internally. Okay? So in a way, it undermined the possibility of constructing an alternative. So it, it's a, a, a reasonable feeling of them against us. Well, no. The, the, the maintaining the position is describing its effect in Zimbabwe was to batter ZANU PF. Mm. That's what it did. Mm. So contrary to the legend, that kind of regime change mantra did not produce that result. Robert Mugabe became richer. You, you, do you know what I mean? Mm. In the meantime, as they say, when the elephants fight, two elephants, the grass that suffers. And it's the grass that suffered as a result of that kind of misguided, in my view, kind of like privileging Zimbabwe as if it was heaven. You know what I mean? So, so that's one part of it. The second part of it is this. It is the, 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 the cycle of inequality, call it what you may, is not a product of one person. Zimbabwe is not led from the front in the way in which we th the West thinks, much as we would like it to be. Right? I think you would deny people urgency. There are reasons why people remained in support of the time, 50 time is our enemy. block. Time so is that's our it. Enemy. Time is our enemy. <laughs> Stephen Gilly, uh, as a member of the opposition, uh, from a political point of view and from a personal point of view, you haven't been back to Zim. It's still the persecution because if you see what has happened the last few days, the uh, polling agents, most of them are in hiding because of those V11, which were not produced by the ZEC officials. And if we are saying the small people who were just 
doing the polling system? What about the people who are saying to the Western world, we still have the problem? So you still it? think it's a dangerous place for somebody who's yes. a member of the opposition to be, yes. even though the opposition was able to run in the election? Because they wanted to cleanse themselves, to look good in the Western okay. world. And that's what they're doing now, even stopping that Chamisa conf uh, conference. It was a matter of... You mean the one outside? Yes. Well, I, the hotel. I, the I, I watched the one outside and it seemed to be allowed to go ahead quite, quite normally. No, I, not the, the one the where Simon Kamoyo went to dispense the, the police. Okay. So you, in five years' time, you think what may have changed that would allow you to go back? We'll go back in the drawing board as we still believe we won the elections. We'll go down to the people in the rural areas, try and understand their position and go as well in the urban. Because in some urban areas, the numbers which we had in 2013 went down. Okay, listen, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for coming on. It was a little moment before we went on air when we talked about the expectations for Zimbabwe, the place that has been labelled the breadbasket of Africa. And we came across in this programme the views that perhaps expectations were a little bit too high, that it was put on a pedestal unnecessarily and to its own detriment. Well, Zimbabwe has a new president. It is the same president, but it isn't Robert Mugabe, so perhaps there is room for change of a kind. You've been watching Roundtable. I'm David Foster. Thank you very much to my guests for coming on the programme. We hope to have your company next time. Bye-bye for now.